And for my first grand rounds, I wanted to choose a topic that was common to uh, both the academic and um, the community urologist. My goal is to provide up-to-date information on options for us as urologists, what we can use. And from the, from the beginning, we'll just come right out and say, you're not going to find any randomized controlled trials here. There's no level one evidence. And uh, we're going to be looking at a number of smaller, um, some prospective, some retrospective studies looking into chronic scrotal pain. Um, my hope is that uh, we'll be able to at least come up with something new or at least some ideas for what we can do for our patients as this is quite common. Our objectives for today, we're going to be looking at the definition, epidemiology and etiology of chronic scrotal pain, outline basic management plan for patients with chronic scrotal pain, and then look at the current literature uh, for the surgical management of chronic scrotal pain, focusing primarily on microsurgical spermatic cord denervation. So a few definitions to begin with. Back in 1990, Journal of Urology paper by Davis, chronic orchalgia was defined as intermittent or constant unilateral or bilateral testicular pain lasting for more than three months. Now, more recently, um, there have been some newer definitions coming out Lawrence Levine out of Chicago has tried to group everything in one um, definition, calling it chrono, chronic scrotal content pain. And he defines this as chronic orchalgia that can also include pain localized to epididymis, vas, or paratesticular structures. Going the other way, European Urology Guidelines on Chronic Pelvic Pain Syndrome from 2013 have defined um, separate entities within the scrotum. Their definitions all include a basic framework. That framework includes the basic definition of occurrence of persistent or recurrent episodic pain localized within the scrotum, may be associated with symptoms of urinary tract or sexual dysfunction. There's no proven infection or other pathology. And they do mention scrotal pain syndrome is often associated with negative cognitive, behavioral, sexual, or emotional consequences. And I think this is one of the things that makes uh, diagnosing and treating chronic scrotal pain uh, so challenging. Now, their definition for scrotal pain syndrome specifically um, needs to have the site of pain being not clearly in the testis or epididymis. Along those same lines, they then have definitions for testicular pain syndrome, so same framework, but located specifically in the testis, epididymal pain specifically in the epididymis, and then they have also highlighted post-vasectomy scrotal pain syndrome as a separate entity, and that's pain in the scrotum, obviously, after a vasectomy, occurring as frequent as 1%, um, though we'll look at some of the literature that suggests this could be quite a bit higher. So, a few basics on chronic scrotal pain, and just from hearing people coming in this morning, I think this is something that most of us see frequently, uh, approximately 350 to 400 cases per 100,000 men per year. That would mean about 65,000 men uh, have this in Canada as an incidence. And approximately 1% of men with chronic scrotal pain are actually pursuing surgical intervention. Age range is 35 to 50 years, and if untreated, this can go on longer, but this often happens in young, otherwise reasonably healthy men. Nearly 2.5% of urology office visits related to chronic scrotal pain. And it may feel like more than that for some of us, but um, this was the, the only study I found. Um, <laughs> and the other thing is that patients with chronic scrotal pain often see multiple urologists. So one study found that on average, each patient saw 4.5 urologists. So this is something that people aren't satisfied with the treatment they're getting and they are seeking um, other options. At least four diagnostic tests occurring in each patient, and this could be as simple as urinalysis or ultrasound, sometimes CT or MRI of the abdomen and pelvis, um, or local cord blocks. And as you can imagine, this poses a significant cost to our healthcare system, as well as um, in missed work and decreased productivity as well. So one of the major things with chronic scrotal pain is quality of life. These are young men 
who are otherwise relatively healthy, they're in the prime of their life, they should be out in the workforce being productive, and they're dealing with chronic pain. The EUA guidelines, as we mentioned earlier, <coughs> highlights this by saying chronic scrotal pain is often associated with negative cognitive, behavioral, sexual, or emotional consequences. Most of the uh, papers that I saw related to this quality of life aspect was with chronic pelvic pain syndrome, but I did find one paper that looked at uh, chronic scrotal pain specifically. They took 50 uh, patients with chronic scrotal pain and 50 age match patients and gave them um, the International Index of Erectile Function Questionnaire. And what they found, patients with, and this was specifically orcalgia, had decreased scores in orgasmic function, intercourse satisfaction, sexual desire, overall sexual satisfaction, and then obviously the total scores. What wasn't different was their actual erectile function. So there was no issues with erection itself, but just with the quality. Now, one of the difficulties with chronic scrotal pain, and Dr. Gleave mentioned this to me right when he came in this morning, is that I'm lumping multiple entities into one talk. So chronic scrotal pain can be divided into scrotal and extrascrotal causes. Within scrotal causes, one of the mo more common ones, post-vasectomy pain, in many papers reports up to 15% of patients experience some kind of chronic scrotal pain. And then other entities within the scrotum, varicocele, spermatocele, infection, intermittent torsion, and even medications. There's one paper on amiodarone. And then extrascrotal causes. So this is referred pain down to the scrotum. It's anything along the course of the ilioinguinal or genital femoral nerves. Often this is an inguinal hernia or post hernia repair, but can be any of the other things on the list here. I think you should add prostatitis into that list. And I will mention that um, a little bit later, but yes, um, on when we look at the doing a physical exam, looking at prostatitis is also important because many of these entities are um, combined in the chronic pelvic pain syndrome or just pel or chronic pain in general. And one of the big challenges and important things to know is that up to 50% of chronic scrotal pain is idiopathic, so no, no diagnosis can really be found. So in 2015, Lawrence Levine, who is out of Rush University in Chicago and has published a number of papers in this area, put out um, a treatment algorithm giving some options for um, the basics. So obviously we start with a history and physical exam. On history, we're looking for how long has this been going, how much does it affect daily life, how severe is it, usually using the visual analog scale. Um, have, has the patient had prior surgery? Do they have any kidney stones? Has there been trauma? On physical exam, trying to localize the source of the pain. So is it within the scrotum or is it extra scrotal? Um, some of those things include a DRE, as Dr. Masterson mentioned, because prostatitis can often um, be either involved or there can be some pain um, similar to it. Um, the highlights from this algorithm, the basics are conservative management is the place to start. If you find something pathologic, so if you see a tumor, if there's torsion or a varicocele, then treat what is pathologic. If not, try and localize the pain, treat conservatively, and try and rule out extra scrotal causes. And we'll come back to this diagram a little bit later. So conservative treatment options. The basics, what we tell everybody and what most patients probably will have been told by their family doctor or the internet by the time they come to our office, rest, ice, scrotal support. I think one of the big things is that chronic pain, um, there is a significant psychosocial aspect to it, and so pain education and counseling is important, and whether that's done by us in office or probably what's better would be to look to um, professionals who have more time to deal with this, who can go into some of the more significant issues with patients, um, freeing up some of our office time. So pain education and counseling uh, can be very useful. Basics for medical management, NSAIDs, 
followed by TCAs or gabapentin. One small study um, published in 2007 looked at 26 patients, started on either gabapentin or tricyclic antidepressants. What they noticed is about two-thirds of the patients had a greater than 50% improvement in their pain over a 27-month period. So reasonable results, but that still leaves a number of people who aren't going to respond. Uh, they did note that there was a poor response in patients who had undergone vasectomy previously. And obviously no control group, so we don't know anything about placebo effect in this study. For chronic epididymitis, you can trial antibiotics, but the data behind that is not uh, too promising. There are reports on acupuncture, pelvic floor therapy, if there are pelvic floor spasms, local steroid injections, thinking that um, the cause of the pain is inflammatory response in the cord, trying to decrease that inflammation, and then transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, sorry, stimulation which um, you can buy a TENS system at Costco or at another drugstore and do this yourself at home. So, conservative management, there's not great data on it. Some people respond, some people don't. Lots of people will still be left with chronic pain. So then from Levine's um, diagram, the other thing is if you see an identifiable cause, treat it. So post-vasectomy pain. Again, young men, prime of their life, who have pain. There's a study out of OHSU by Polakwich et al. published in Urology in 2015 looking at vasovasostomy or vasoepididymostomy. They took 31 men, median age 38. Now one of the theories behind post-vasectomy pain is that you get this buildup of pressure in the epididymis um, after vasectomy and that that leads to pressure and pain. So the thought is if you reverse that, you may be able to eliminate that pressure buildup and eliminate some of the pain. In their study, 34% reported complete resolution of pain, 82% in total reported at least a 50% improvement. <coughs> the mean visual analog scale scores pre-op 6.6, .6, post-op 1.2, and you can see pre-op scores in black, post-op scores in gray, a fairly significant trend towards little to no pain post-operatively. Now other research has been done. Um, this one did require four repeat procedures, so vasovasostomies that ended up um, being done as vasoepididymostomies. Other research um, did uh, come up in the EUA guidelines from 2013 saying vasovasostomy is effective in post vasectomy pain, level of evidence 2B, and more importantly, grade A recommendation that when we are going to do vasectomies, we do need to inform our patients that it is um, something they may encounter. AUA guidelines on vasectomy from 2012 that was updated in 2015 state that approximately 1-2% to of patients post vasectomy will have pain that impacts their daily life. So the other option for post vasectomy pain is epididymectomy. So a study from 2009 looked at 45 patients with a mean follow-up of 7.4 years, pain scores pre-op 7.3, post-op 2.4, and again, a very similar graph as you saw in the last one, pre-op. Pain score is fairly high, post-op much improved. And they looked at satisfaction rate. So I guess we can look at the numbers, we can look at pain scores, but in the end, I think when you're looking at chronic pain, we need to say, how are the patients doing afterwards? Are they satisfied? Are they actually happy that they went through with the surgery? And so satisfaction rate in this study was 93%. Another study looked at epididymal pain, um, but this time, instead of just post vasectomy, they looked at just general epididymal pain. They took 53 patients, mean age 53 years, performed epididymectomy. All of these studies I should highlight as people who have failed conservative therapy first. So 
they're not recommending in any way going straight to surgery. So in this study, they had three different groups. They had the post-vasectomy, epididymal pain, chronic epididymitis with no vasectomy, and then an epididymal cyst, so something that was actually pathologic or um, abnormal. And again, fairly significant drop in pain scores, but more significant in post-vasectomy and in the epididymal cysts, and not as good when there was no pathologic um, thing identified. They also looked at satisfaction rates, and they reviewed the literature on this. For post-vasectomy, overall, 83% satisfaction. Chronic epididymitis, approximately 57%. And painful epididymal cysts, 80%. Then varicoceles. So a study from 2014, looking at varicocelectomy in 48 patients, mean age 38 years, with a follow-up of 20 months. So you can see here, preoperative pain scores were lower in this uh, study than in post vasectomy pain. Still fairly significant response. The procedure done was a laparoscopic varicocelectomy, and it was for dull chronic scrotal pain. Overall, 42 patients noted significant improvement, so greater than 50% reduction in their visual analog scale score. Though there were five recurrences, and there were hydrocele formation in four of the patients. And then orchiectomy. So this um, is not a well-studied area. It is something that uh, was used I think a long time ago, it doesn't seem like, there hasn't been a new paper on this in about 30 years. So, orchiectomy, no recent studies. Success rates from the past, 20 to 80 percent, um, but those are in studies of 10 people. So, I don't think those numbers are very reliable. From what's been done, inguinal approach appears to be a little bit better than a scrotal approach. And you also have to consider and discuss with your patient the psychological impact of losing a testis. EUA guidelines mentioned this in their 2013 chronic pelvic pain syndrome guidelines. So orchiectomy is the last resort with low quality evidence and don't do orchiectomy unless you've done everything else and you're completely stuck, which I take as saying it's probably not a good idea no matter what. So what if that doesn't work? So you've maybe identified some obvious things, varicoceles or post vasectomy pain. What are our other options? So we go back to our algorithm. Um, if you notice down at the bottom, there's a little gap. There's a couple arrows there. And this is for the patient who you've done your conservative management. Maybe you've operated on already. Maybe you haven't. And they're frustrated. You're frustrated because they keep coming back with the same problem and you know that their pain probably isn't just going to go away on its own, whether it's psychological or something else. You're not exactly sure. So what else can you do? Before we get to um, the options, we're going to take just a brief look at some of the theories in chronic pain. So the question is, what role do the pathological changes in nerve sensation, transmission, and processing play in chronic scrotal pain? Previously, there was a question, is pain a binary process? Do you get input and result? And back in 2000, in a landmark paper, Wolf et al. published in Science, and this is a paper that's been cited over 3,000 times now, and they looked into neuronal plasticity, and what they highlighted is very clearly pain is not static and pain is not passive. They developed a conceptual framework for how neuronal plasticity in both the peripheral and central nervous systems leads to pain hypersensitivity as well as chronic neuropathic pain. What they found, pain response to a stimuli is a continuum based on reactions of neurons to changes in their environment. So it's always changing. They coined the terms activation, modulation, and modification going from normal pain response and taking that and twisting it into a persistent pathological pain and determine that abnormalities in neuronal plasticity leads to chronic pain. 
The other concept that comes up repeatedly in chronic pelvic pain syndrome and chronic scrotal pain is that of Wallerian degeneration. Now, this is a normal stereotypic series of events occurring after injury to a nerve, whether it be traumatic, toxic, ischemic, or metabolic. This is well studied in peripheral nerve injuries, and again, it's a normal response. The goal of this is to create an environment that stimulates axonal regrowth and supports regeneration of damaged nerves. The process involves breakdown of the blood nerve barrier, proliferation of Schwann cells, recruitment of circulating macrophages, and then in turn increased production of cytokines and a reorganization of the endoneural space. Basically, it's a significant inflammatory response to try and provoke, to promote nerve healing. And it's thought that abnormalities in this process leads to nerve hypersensitivity and chronic neuropathic pain. So, getting into our basic scrotal anatomy, somatic nerves to the scrotum via the ilioinguinal, the genital branch of the genital femoral, and the pedendal nerve. Autonomics coming in to the testis and epididymis via the renal and aortic plexus, traveling along the gonadal vessels. So, um, one author, Pericatil, um, from Florida, he's been doing significant research into this down in uh, Florida, published in 2013. He looked at the anatomy behind chronic scrotal pain. They examined spermatic cord biopsies of 66 patients. These were routine specimens taken. Some of the patients done for pain. They had microsurgical spermatic cord denervation, which we'll talk about shortly. And other patients came in and had surgery not for pain-related purposes on either varicoceles or orchiectomy for malignancy. What they found was that the nerve density in the spermatic cord is greatest in three main areas. They termed this the trifecta nerve complex, and they confirmed these areas from their biopsies using cadaveric specimens. And on the right, you can see one of their specimens, and from greatest to least nerve density, um, the intracremasteric complex had on average 19 nerves, the peribasal complex, 9 nerves, and the periarterial had 3 nerves per patient on average. So what they're doing at their site is they're trying to now focus on those three areas specifically when they do their procedure in microsurgical spermatic cord denervation um, to um, preserve some of the spermatic cord structures. They haven't published anything yet um, on focused targeting. They also noticed that there was increased Wallerian degeneration in patients having surgery for pain and compared to those for non-pain related purposes. So now we get back to our algorithm and what we were missing before was our what are our options for patients who failed their conservative management, who maybe have failed some surgical management, and the next thing is a spermatic cord block. So localizing the pain to is it in the scrotum or is it extrascrotal. For people who have no response to a spermatic cord block, unfortunately there aren't any further options. Um, spermatic cord block is a significant predictor of success with the things we're going to talk about in the next few slides. If you do have a significant improvement, so greater than 50%, then you can proceed to what we're going to talk about now, which is microsurgical spermatic cord denervation. Procedure was first performed in 1978 on two patients by Devine and Shellhammer, published uh, in Journal of Urology at that time, they, their two patients both had successful outcomes. A few small studies came up since then, um, and we'll go into those in a few minutes. This can be used as a primary surgical treatment for chronic scrotal pain, or after other surgical attempts have failed in correcting chronic scrotal pain. The important thing to remember is that first you need to do a cord block, because cord block predicts success. A number of complications have been highlighted. Most are minor, hydrocele's, wound infections, arterial injury, which in one study was quoted as around 1%, testicular atrophy, and hematomas, seromas. 
European guidelines for patients who are treated surgically for scrotal pain, microsurgical denervation of the spermatic cord is recommended. So grade A recommendation. 2B level of evidence saying that microsurgical denervation of spermatic cord is an effective therapy. So the basics of it. All patients receive general anesthetic. Two centimeter low inguinal incision over the external inguinal ring. You dissect down to locate the cord and expose the ring. You identify the ilioinguinal nerve and excise a two to three centimeter segment and ligate the ends. The proximal end is tucked under the external ring in a hope to prevent neuroma formation, as this can be a cause of pain post inguinal surgery. The cord is then elevated and set on a Penrose drain. The operating microscope is brought in, and most, most sites use operating microscope, but we'll see one site's using the robot for this, and some people are even using just their, um, their surgical loops. So you open the anterior spermatic cord fascia for about three to four centimeters. Microdoppler is used for uh, identification of arteries. And then what you do is you identify each of your arteries and using vessel loops, you can um, highlight these, identify them, mark them, and then proceed with your dissection. Lymphatics are usually left in place, though this isn't done at all sites. The thought is to or sorry, um, reduce the risk of hydrocele formation. If a patient's had a vasectomy previously, uh, the cord is redivided. If a patient hasn't had a vasectomy, um, the external sort of fascial layer on the vas is removed, but the vas is left intact, hoping to prevent what is thought to be chronic pain from um, buildup of pressure in the epididymis. In this image here, this is from Levine from 2015, and from top to bottom, um, you have the cremasteric artery the lymphatics, the internal spermatic artery, and the vas deferens and everything else has been dissected. On the right, this is Dr. Darby Cassidy's work from Prince George, one of our think, clinical associates here at UBC, and he's performing this procedure in Prince George, and that's what his final uh, work looks like. This, these images come from a study um, internationally done in Chilean uh, Germany, and they preserved only the vas and only the testicular artery. So they took all other structures, and on the left you see them in their initial dissection, cremaster has been opened, and they've identified the vas on the left and the artery on the right, and then their final product you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, yeah. Explain why they so the, I think the question is whether the venous drainage actually matters, and it's thought that if you don't take the venous, venous drainage, then that drainage will go through um, your external spermatic, um, sorry, not spermatic, your external scrotal drainage. And so there, they didn't actually notice a significant difference with hematoma. So they felt that it would be picked up by other venous drainage in the scrotum. Yeah, it makes it a little bit easier. So getting on to some of the studies. Back in 2001, Lawrence Levine published on 27 patients, 32 testicular units. Mean age was 45. All patients failed conservative therapy. And to be included in the study, you needed to have at least a 50% improvement on spermatic cord block. Mean follow-up, and they had three different groups in this, 19, 24, and 10 months each. So their three groups were unknown etiology, those with previous surgery, and those with a known etiology but no surgery. Overall, their numbers 76% complete response, 9% partial, and 15% had no response to the procedure. One thing I will highlight, the data is very similar for each study, and no studies actually mention if patients got worse. It's just no response. So whether there's some people that are getting worse I'm not exactly sure, and I don't think that's been reported. In 2008, out of the same center, um, they updated their data, now with 79 patients, including the 27 from previous, 95 testicular units, again, 
same inclusion criteria, mean follow-up of 20 months, and overall 71% complete response, meaning zero pain postoperatively, no response in 12%. Then we had another study in 2002 published in European Urology, 35 patients, mean age 46, follow-up 34 months. Now the difference in this study is that they only accepted patients who had a complete temporary response to a cord block. So again, we've said cord block predicts success. So this study, 35 patients, and only accepted into the study if you had a complete response. There were two scrotal hematomas here. Overall, initially, so within a few weeks of surgery, all patients had a successful response. And at last follow-up, so mean follow-up 34 months, 34 out of 35 patients were pain-free. So again, suggesting that a cord block predicts success of a procedure. Now this was studied uh, by Benson, published in Journal of Sex Med in 2013. They looked retrospectively at 74 patients who had undergone microsurgical spermatic cord denervation. And they found that the pain response to the cord block was very similar in terms of the drop in the visual analog scale score as that to going undergoing uh, microsurgical spermatic cord denervation. Spermatic cord block was the only independent predictor of success. Then we have data from Dr. Cassidy. So he published in CUAJ in 2015. Um, Dr. Cassidy did his men's health fellowship in um, Toronto and has been in Prince George for a few years now. So first published experience at a Canadian center, just a case series, nine patients, mean age 42, follow-up was a little shorter in his, just three to nine months. So average visual analog scale pain scores, 7.5 pre-op, 0.1 post-op. Overall complete response in seven of nine patients, partial response in two of nine. The partial response though, their pain scores were less than one and he had no complications. Another study from 2013 in Journal of Urology looked at patients postoperatively. So these are patients who have failed uh, surgery. They had a control group, so 38 patients, no prior surgery, 30 patients with surgery. These are the procedures that had been performed. So again, a wide spectrum. Mean age, 42 months, follow up 10 months. And you can see here, surgery naive in green, and previous surgery in gray. So a better response for people who are surgery naive, but still a complete response seen in 50% of patients who had already failed another surgical intervention. And then this is one of the few uh, double-blinded studies. The double-blind was the cord block, not the surgical intervention itself. This was published in Pain in 2014 they did a series of three cord blocks. So lidocaine, bupivacaine, normal saline. The thought is that they're trying to focus better on um, patients who actually respond to the cord blocks and not patients who are having a placebo effect, thinking that that will avoid surgery in patients who don't need it and who won't benefit from it. So patients were included in the study if they had a positive response to lidocaine and bupivacaine, negative response to normal saline, mean follow-up 42 months, and this diagram, if you go down the left side, 69 patients in total had a positive response to the cord blocks, 53 underwent the procedure, and 50% were pain-free, pain reduction of greater than 50% in an additional 38% of patients, and no reduction in 13%. So very similar results to what had been published previously. Complications, one hydrocele, one hematoma in the group. More recent study from 2015, this is where some of our images came from earlier. Three centers in Chile, one in Germany. 50 patients, 52 testicular units, two cord blocks. Again, one sham cord block and one real one to try and eliminate patients who wouldn't benefit from surgery. In this study, it was interesting, they had 70% of patients included who did not have a clear diagnosis for their pain. Six-month follow-up. And what they found was there was an 80% complete response and no response in 8%. Complications here, one hematocele, one hydrocele. And now on to the robot. So 
the robot seems to be picking up in BC. Surgeries are starting to be covered by the government, so maybe this is uh, something I say this humorously that we could be doing. So, paracatil down in Florida, 401 procedures using the robot. They use the pain impact questionnaire. Uh, the basis of their procedure, they start with a one to two centimeter incision, they dissect down to the cord, deliver the cord, ligate ilioinguinal and genital femoral nerves, and then they bring in the robot. Once the robot's in, supposed and set up, the procedure takes about 15 minutes. Where do they put the robot? Where do they put? Yeah, but this is a system that they don't insert anything into the no. scrotum or something no. like that? No, it's just for visualization, purely for visualization purposes. Yeah. They've got a funny shaped head so they can't wear roots or something. Possibly. Yeah. There's no microscope. They had more robots than microscopes, maybe. <laughs> Median follow-up, 23 months. Now, a couple things they did differently. One thing, they utilized a bio-inert wrap to prevent cord neuroma. They did a small little study with six patients uh, who had bilateral scrotal pain. Um, they wrapped one side, didn't wrap the other side, and noticed a small improvement in pain scores with the side that was wrapped. Um, this has been studied... Um, quite a bit more in uh, peripheral nerves elsewhere in the body. They also use hydro dissection of the vas to try and um, identify more clearly some of the very small nerves that run along the vas. List of their complications here, hematoma being the most common, about two and a half to three percent, and their results. So complete response in 72 percent of patients, partial response in 14, and no response in 14. So again, keeping with all of the other numbers that we've seen previously. What was the, um, do they report on testicular loss rates? So testicular atrophy, there, were, there was none reported here. There was one um, atrophic testis that went from I believe a volume of 20 cc's down to 12 cc's after one procedure reported in another paper, um, but the patient had no pain afterwards and they talked about satisfaction in that case and the satisfaction was good, but there's only been one one case that I read about, about atrophy. In, along those lines, did any of them follow up on sort of ultrasound volume of the testicle? Is this affecting? No. Um, but that's a, that's a very good question because I think that is a reasonable concern going forward, but no. And most of the follow-up is relatively short in these as well. So alternative treatments. Botox. So the thought is if a nerve block works, then maybe Botox will work. Two studies we're going to look at, one out of Toronto, published in Journal of Sex Med in 2014. Um, 18 patients received 100 units of onobotulinum A after they had a positive cord block. Not very exciting results. At one month, 72% had a positive response rate, though their VAST scores went from 7.3 to 5.8, so a very minimal drop. By three months, only 56% of patients reported an improvement, and by six months, no difference. The second study that's a little bit more exciting was performed by Tojiola in 2016. This looked at 25 patients, same dose of Botox, and they looked at visual analog scales at eight months. At this point, 14% had a complete response, and 56% of patients at eight months had a greater than 50% response. Pain index questionnaire was also utilized, which showed a significant reduction in pain in 40% at six months, 20% at a year. Next option, micro. Holly, what's the biologic hypothesis view? behind this because Botox is kind of blocks the mo motor plane. Motor, yeah. So how a sensory effect can get, can we get a problem out of this? So that's what, in, in reading their papers, the two papers that were published, it's not a great um, e explanation of why they think it would work. What they talk about is that you're blocking nerve transmission. They don't specify on the fact that Botox is used primarily for, or always for, muscular changes. And so I, I don't think there's 
great backing to this method, and I don't think the results show much difference. The next is microcryoablation. So ultrasound guided targeted microcryoablation of the perispermatic cord, 60 patients, all who failed microsurgical spermatic cord denervation. They did a cord block to start with and inserted a cryoprobe medial and lateral, froze the tissue to negative 40 degrees Celsius for 90 seconds, and they noted a 9% complete resolution, 65% had greater than a 50% improvement in pain at 11 months. Pain index questionnaire, 59% significant reduction at 6 months and 56% at 11 months, so slightly better than the Botox results. Their complications, one wound infection and one patient developed penile pain from it. Next, radio, radio frequency denervation. So this was a case series, five patients. What happened, they inserted a 22 gauge IV needle, took out the needle and inserted their radio frequency probe. They did sensory stimulation testing and performed radio frequency ablation to the most sensitive areas. Questionable in how they're setting this up. Their pre-op analog scale scores 9, post-op 1, no recurrences during their 20-month follow-up. Obviously, if this is going to be something that comes into play, lots more research needs to be done. And the last one is looking at multi-photon imaging and laser ablation. So again, just trying to visualize the nerves in the spermatic cord more easily. And this was done in a lab study using rats, and they were able to identify at each individual nerve and ablate it and then see their results based on pathological specimens. There hasn't been any human studies published on this. So, in conclusion, chronic scrotal pain is a common and challenging condition to diagnose and treat. Conservative management is the mainstay of therapy, followed by surgical treatment of identifiable causes. Microsurgical spermatic cord denervation is a reasonable option for patients with chronic scrotal pain, but Controlled studies would be beneficial. Orchiectomy is a last resort and probably should be avoided. And novel therapies are being developed, and we may see uh, further research on these. Thank you.